Welcome to the POSIS JCC community conversation for the movie, The Crossing. We are very excited to have you here today and um, look forward to a wonderful presentation and discussion. I have the honor of introducing our moderator for the community conversation, Jim Finkel. Jim's bio is as follows. Jim is a non-resident fellow with the Henry Stimson Center's Protecting Civilians in a Conflict Program and the co-founder of the Atrocities Prevention Study Group. He served as the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum Center for the Prevention of Genocides, Leonard and Sophie Davis Genocide Prevention Fellow from 2013 to 2014. Wow. Jim ended his 35 year government career in May of 2013 as a member of the Federal Senior Civil Service. During his final 20 years of service, he held positions that provided him an insider's eye view of the evolution of US policy toward the prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. He assisted in crafting the Obama administration's Presidential Study Directive 10, which created the Interagency Atrocities Prevention Board. Jim holds a master's degree in international affairs from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a Bachelor of Arts from Rutgers College, Rutgers University. Go New Jersey. Jim? Thank you, Sherry. And thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. We have two very knowledgeable and distinguished speakers with us who will share their thoughts about the crossing. First, we have Dr. Annette Hamlong Storide. Annette has been a senior researcher at Falstead Memorial Center, located in the former SS prison camp Falstead near Trondheim, Norway, uh, since 2017. She is the lead researcher on war and genocide studies and represents Falstead as a member of the Norwegian delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Annette is affiliated with the Norwegian University of Science and Technology as an associate professor in German and European cultural history. She's published a number of books and articles on World War II and remembrance culture. Her main research interests are war history, economic history, history didactics, memory research, and genocide studies. Her ongoing research revolves around World War II prisoner history and history policy, actors and networks as memory entrepreneurs for the memory of World War II and the Holocaust, the importance of place and topography for memory production and storytelling, digital reconstruction and the notion of authenticity in storytelling, and biographical representations in exhibitions about World War II and the Holocaust. And its doctoral dissertation at the University of Oslo focused on the testimony of Norwegian Sachsenhausen prisoners. Next, we have Dr. Susan Rubin Suleiman. Susan was born in Budapest and emigrated to the United States as a child with her parents. She obtained her bachelor's from Barnard College and her doctorate from Harvard University and has been on the Harvard faculty since 1981 where she is currently the C. Douglas Dillon Professor of the Civilization of France and Professor uh -huh. of Comparative Literature. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. She's the author or editor of a dozen books and more than a hundred articles on contemporary literature and culture published in the US and abroad. Her most recent book is the Naromsky Question, the Wait, life, death, and legacy of a Jewish okay. writer in 20th century uh, he is, but could you try? Her other books include Crisis of Memory and the Second World War, okay. Risking Who yeah. One Is, okay. Encounters with okay. Contemporary okay. Art and Literature, okay. and the memoir Budapest Diary in Search of the Mother Book. Her book reviews and articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Atlantic, and other newspapers and magazines. She's been awarded many honors and has held Guggenheim and Rockefeller fellowships, among others. In 1992, she was named an officer, uh, I'm sorry, officier de pomme académique uh, by the French government. And in 2018, she was awarded France's highest honor, 
the Légion de Honneur. Uh, we're going to begin today's discussion about the crossing with remarks by Annette and then turn to Susan. We'll follow that with a little back and forth between the three of us. The chat function will be open throughout and we want to invite the audience to submit questions, which I will then put to our panelists. With that, Annette, I want to turn the floor over to you. Uh, Annette and Susan will have some slides. I'll ask the audience to minimize their gallery views while the slides are up so that everyone can better see the slides. So Annette, please, um, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I can't see the PowerPoint, so is it? Okay, Sherry's going to put Sherry? up the PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, that's mine. <laughs> well, there we go. Okay, this is just uh, this is a picture of the memorial sites where I'm working, uh, which used to be, uh, among others, uh, the SS Camp Falstad uh, outside Trondheim. Um, you can, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to uh, the history and the memory of the Second World War in Norway and mainly focus on uh, the, hist the situation of the Norwegian Jews and uh, the Holocaust in Norway. So please share if you can switch uh, the slate for me. Thank you. Uh, Norway was attacked by Nazi Germany in April 1940. And um, after two months of um, war, uh, the Norwegian armed forces uh, uh, surrendered and um, Nazi Germany installed on one hand a German administration uh, in Norway, but there was also, as you probably know, a collaboration of regime uh, under the lead of the sort of main Norwegian um, Nazi leader, Wittgen Kisling. And this is important to understand the situation, um, especially for the, the Jewish population, uh, because there is an interaction between Norwegian and um, German security police uh, that takes place that ends in uh, fatally for the Norwegian uh, Jews. Um, compared to other Western European countries that were occupied by Germany, like Belgium, Netherlands, and France, uh, systematic anti-Jewish measures were introduced rather, rather late in Norway, and not until January 1942. So 1942 is uh, sort of the main year of uh, the Holocaust in Norway. And as you probably remember from the film, the film takes place in fall 1942. Um, until the end of December 1941, meaning you know, the first one and a half year of German occupation, uh, the life of the Jewish uh, citizens in Norway did not very much differ from that life of uh, the non-Jewish citizens. There were single actions and initiatives undertaken by the German security police, like uh, the confiscation of uh, radios. Uh, there were some arrests of Jewish uh, citizens. Um, selected shops or property were confiscated or closed. There were anti-Jewish propaganda, um, especially uh, after uh, Nazi Germany attacked uh, the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, there was an escalation, small escalation of the situation in certain geographical areas in Norway. For example, in the northern part of Norway, uh, Jewish men were arrested and imprisoned, also so-called stateless Jews or Jews with Eastern European passports were arrested. Um, the anti-Jewish propaganda in the press increased. Um, there were also some geographical differences uh, and to the fact that the anti-Jewish politics in the region around Trondheim, where I'm living, was more radical in the rest of the country, but there were no systematically anti-Jewish measures introduced until January, 1942. And in January 1942, the Norwegian Ministry of Police released a decree of identification stating that identification papers of all Jews were to be marked with the letter J, 
for Jew. The identification was soon followed by a registration of the Jews in Norway and their property. And this process singled out the Jewish citizens from the rest of, of the population. This was early 1942. Then pretty much nothing more happened until fall 1942. During the state of emergency in the region of Trondheim in the beginning of October, which was uh, installed as part of the attempt to squash the Norwegian resistance movement in the area, the Jews were especially targeted. One Jewish citizen was executed and all male Jews in the region uh, above 15 years were arrested and imprisoned in the SS camp Falstad. And then the second uh, important event in October 1942 that led to uh, the Holocaust in Norway was an incident on a train uh, to Halden. This is a border region, a city in a border region in Norway. And as you probably remember from the film, the children are going by train to Halden. And Halden was a sort of a popular city for people who wanted to illegally escape to Sweden because it's so close to the border. But um, on the 22nd of October in 1942, a border pilot that was going to bring Jewish refugees to Sweden was um, uncovered by a border policeman on the train and the situation escalated and uh, the border pilot, so this guide bringing uh, the refugees to Sweden, uh, ended up uh, shooting and uh, killing the policeman. And this incident was taken, um, first of all, uh, as, okay, this is, first of all, as an um, uh, excuse for um, increasing anti-Jewish propaganda, but it was also used as an excuse to step up the actions against the Jews in Norway. And there is a debate among historians to what extent uh, this event led to the arrest of the male Jews in Norway, or if it was just a coincidence as a, that the events took place uh, at the same time. Because on the 26th of October 1942, all Jewish men in Norway were arrested and imprisoned. Um, and then one month later, also, women and children were rounded up and sent uh, to Oslo. And the intention was to have one large deportation transport by ship from Oslo to um, uh, the occupied Poland and to Auschwitz. Um, and on the 26th of November, 1942, uh, the ship Donau, which I will show you a photograph of later, uh, left Oslo with 532 Jews on board. Uh, but because not all uh, the Jews could be brought to Oslo on time for this uh, transport, the next deportation took place on the 25th of February 1943, 158 uh, Jews were uh, deported. And as a parallel to these two large uh, deportations, uh, the Norwegian uh, collaboration on regime released a law on the confiscation of all Jewish property in Norway, they also established a board of liquidation of Jewish property, as it was called, which was commissioned to take care of all practicalities, meaning um, essentially that uh, between November 1942 and February 1943, Jewish life in Norway was expected to be erased and all property confiscated and it was also even stated that all photo albums and personal effects should be uh, destroyed. So if you can please show the next slide, Sherry, uh, of the statistics of Holocaust in Norway. Um, the Jewish population in Norway was a very small minority. In, at the time of the German attack, um, there were about 2,100 Jews living in Norway most of them Norwegian citizens, but also um, about 400 refugees, mainly from Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia, who had uh, escaped to Norway to uh, avoid uh, arrests by, uh, uh, by Nazi Germany, and then were sort of caught up again uh, when Norway was attacked. 773 Jews were deported, uh, mainly by these two deportations I was talking about, and most of them were deported to Auschwitz. 
uh, of those uh, who were deported, only 38 men survived. Um, the youngest victim was an infant. Uh, the oldest victim was an 81 year old man. And um, Holocaust in Norway led 230 families to be destroyed. Uh, about 1,200 uh, Jews survived by escaping to, uh, to Sweden. And this is sort of similar to what is shown in the film. Norway has a long joint border with Sweden and especially the region around Trondheim and also the southern eastern part of Norway uh, around the city of Halden, which, which is portrayed in the film. Um, were sort of useful areas to escape from and uh, sort of uh, in the southern eastern part of Norway the, the, the standard route would be to go by train to, to Halden and then try to get to the border from there and then walk uh, through the woods uh, to, to Sweden. So some of those who escaped to Sweden uh, escaped by sort of walking by themselves some were also helped by friends or neighbors. And then you had these so-called border pilots, people operating as guides to help people across the border. Many of them uh, were uh, sort of part of the Norwegian uh, resistance. And then you also had organized escape routes and transport uh, by, by the Norwegian resistance. And I have on the next slide, there is especially one large rescue action, which was, uh, which has been become very famous. Um, it, uh, oh, it is, there it is. Carl Fredriksen's distribution company, which was an alias for an organized rescue of more than thousand people, about half of them Jews, that took place during six weeks from the end of November, 1942, as the large, uh, actions against the Norwegian Jews started until mid-January 1943. And the cover-up was a market garden uh, owned by a gardener, uh, Rolf Sieversen, who organized uh, this rescue action together with a suspended policeman, Alf Pettersen, and his uh, Pettersen's wife. And they were um, sort of using lorries to distribute potatoes, as I call them, this code word for, for refugees. This is also mentioned in the film. And on the photo above, you can probably recognize the landscape. This is not from the film. This is uh, one of the original routes uh, used by Carl Fredriksen Distribution Company. But as you can see, the landscape is very similar to what is shown in, in the film. So it very much relates to uh, Carl Fredriksen Distribution Company or these rescue ac actions organized by the Norwegian resistance. Uh, it was forbidden to escape to Sweden. It was also forbidden to help someone escape to Sweden. And in 1942, uh, death penalty was uh, introduced both for the refugees and for the helpers. And in mid-January 1943, after rescuing more than 1,000 people, um, the organizers became afraid that the German security police had uh, uncovered them. Um, and Alf Pettersen and his wife escaped to Sweden themselves. Uh, but um, the gardener, Rolf Sieversen, he didn't want to, to leave his pregnant wife. So he stayed on in Oslo. Uh, he was arrested and executed. Um, and the picture below uh, shows uh, the memorial or memorial in a memorial park in Oslo to honor the members of Carl Fredriksen Distribution Company for their um, actions. And it's, uh, it's named, this is a nice place. It's made by the artist Victor Lind, uh, who's also made a lot of both provocative and commemorative uh, memorials and artworks uh, on the, with the Holocaust in Norway as a, as a main topic. Um, the typical escape route is pretty much, it was pretty much the same which is portrayed in the crossings. When we go with the train to Halden, uh, be transported uh, closer to the border by lorry than having to, to walk uh, through the woods. And often a chain of helpers uh, were um, involved, 
similar to the situation in the film, people providing shelter or hiding for uh, Jews that were waiting to be transported to, to Sweden, P some people providing food and clothes, someone doing the driving, and then you had the border pilots that were guiding refugees uh, to the border through the woods. And as I said, this was a very dangerous and highly illegal action. Um, the next slide, please. <laughs> Um, what kind of film is this? We've been talking about it as a Holocaust film. Um, at the end of the film, the credits commemorate the rescued, uh, the helpers and those who did not return. Um, and I think that this, or personally, I think for me, this is a primarily a film about those who were rescued and those who helped them. And in this way, the film fits very well with what has been the dominating narrative of Norway during the Second uh, World War. The portrayal of the occupation as a time of heroic and patriotic resistance by the Norwegian people. And uh, the story of what happened to the Norwegian Jews during the German occupation has very much been on those who were rescued and those who rescued them, and not on those who were, uh, who were deported and, and murdered. So the story of the Holocaust has also been constructed as a part of the resistance narrative in Norway, where the sort of the traditional portrayal has been of active Norwegian resistance fighters helping and rescuing passive and uh, anxious uh, Jewish citizens. And for a long time, this story was uh, told by um, the movie On Such a Night. Uh, On Such a Night is both a book and a movie. The movie was released in 1957, and the movie depicts a different rescue uh, operation. Um, Carl Fredriksen Distribution Company is one of the most famous in Norway. The second one is the rescue of the children in the Jewish orphanage in Oslo on the 26th of November, 1942. And for uh, many decades, I think that this film on such a night about uh, the rescue of the Jewish children uh, in the orphanage has uh, dominated and sort of become the symbol of the Holocaust in Norway, portraying uh, the resistance more uh, than uh, the Jewish children. Um, there was also been published uh, books by um, Ragnar Ullstein, himself a very famous um, resistance fighter in Norway. He's published uh, and done a lot of research on the rescue of Jews to Sweden. Uh, and this group of people, the rescued one, has been the one to get the main focus and not the deported one. However, um, one must also uh, say that um, sort of the story of the rescue of the Norwegian Jews had also had its counter story with the film Across the Border from 1984, which depicts the so-called Feldman case, the story of Jakob and Rachel Feldman, who were robbed and killed by the border pilots who were supposed to bring them to Sweden. And this is based on a true story. Jakob and Raquel Fellman were killed. Uh, and after uh, the end of the war, the two border pilots were put on trial in Norway, but they ended up being acquitted of the murders. So one can say that this across the border about the Feldman case has portrayed a not very heroic story either about the war or about uh, the Norwegian post-war uh, situation. But um, I would say that um, in all, uh, the story of the rescue of Norwegian Jews has been a main focus and it's been a very uh, suitable story for Norway and fits well with the, the focus on Norwegian uh, resistance. Um, and in that, um, uh, situation, I would also say that um, uh, the crossings very much portrays sort of the traditional narrative of Norway during the Second World War. And this film, as has been the tradition in Norway for many years, does not depict those who did not return, apart from sort of the arrest scenes in Halden and um, in the credits. So that brings me to my last 
uh, remark on the last slide. For many decades, um, Holocaust was an ev event without image and also without agency in Norway. This is a photograph of the ship Donau leaving the harbor of Oslo with 50, 532 Jews on board on uh, the 26th of November in 1942. This is the, was the largest deportation uh, of Jews from Norway. This photo was published for the first time as late as in January 1994 in Norway. I don't have time to tell that story why it happened so late. So if someone wants to hear that story, you have to put a question about it in the chat. Um, but this very much um, demonstrates how little attention the deportation and those who were deported got uh, in Norway. Um, because the standard expression has been, the Jews were deported. The question is though, by whom, who were responsible for the Holocaust in Norway? And this is a story also about um, Norwegian uh, collaboration. So when it comes down to it, yes, many Jews were saved, but many were also deported and killed. And the question that especially has been raised in the last uh, couple of years due to uh, some new books published has been to what extent more Jews could have been rescued? What did the resistance movement actually know about uh, the plans for deporting the Norwegian Jews? Um, and what has also been a, a topic that has been taboo is what did it cost to be rescued? Because these border pilots didn't operate for free. So the question has been raised to what extent did the Jewish people have to uh, pay more to be rescued than non-Jewish Norwegian who were trying to get over the border, for example. And um, what this photo demonstrates is that the Holocaust was not without witnesses and bystanders. Um, this photo, who are the people on the photo watching the ship leaving the harbor? Um, so I think um, to wrap it up, uh, this is the crossing very much tells the traditional story of the Norwegian resistance and focuses on the rescue of the Jews. But it does is for me, it's not a Holocaust movie because it does not depict those who were actually deported and, and killed. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, Susan, we're going to turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was great, uh, very interesting. Uh, and thanks to you, uh, Jim, and to Sherry and all the people who organized this, uh, this conversation. Uh, I should say that Annette and I go way back and I'm so happy to see her after all these years. We, we were together in Oslo 15 years ago when I was there uh, as part of a working group that was studying uh, the way the Holocaust has been represented in film and literature. And uh, we, we, it was a very intense time, and, uh, but we also managed to have a lot of fun uh, and even produced a book out of it so, uh, to which everybody contributed. So that was very nice. Um, well, so Annette has given you the, um, the, the historical background. And uh, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about how the crossing fits into the genre, you could call it, of what, you know, of what I call the Holocaust seen through the eyes of children. Uh, in other words, uh, the, because uh, interestingly, there have been quite a few wonderful, wonderful films uh, about that feature the experience of Jewish children during, uh, during uh, World War II uh, as they faced uh, life-threatening situations. Uh, now, a lot of these children were of course survivors, but uh, that's how we, we get, we have memoirs by them and many of the films uh, are based on memoir by survivors. Uh, but other children of course did not survive. And in fact, the great majority did not, you know, there's a, a piece of, there's a statistic, a historical statistic that really flabbergasted me when I first read it. Uh, in um, Deborah Dwork's very good book on children in uh, Jewish children in, in Nazi-occupied uh, Nazi Europe, which is called Children with a Star. Uh, now in that book, uh, Dwork cites a statistic 
tactic, which, as I say, really, really shocked me. And that was um, that uh, of the uh, children under 16, Jewish children under 16, who were alive in Europe in 1939, <coughs> only 11%, that's one out of nine, uh, were still alive in 1945. So this is, this is just a shocking uh, statistic. Uh, uh, the children who survived, uh, uh, which who are often referred to as hidden children, uh, the children who survived uh, off, uh, did so sometimes with their parents, but very often separated from their parents uh, and, and uh, sometimes permanently separated because their parents did not survive. Uh, so these children were hidden or they had to fend for themselves depending on their age. But uh, you know, uh, what, we, what, what we have is a large variety of experiences, but all of them have many things in common, which is the trauma that was experienced by uh, Jewish children. Uh, as they face this really horrible uh, situation. Uh, so what I did was I made up a little list of uh, my favorite films uh, about, you know, that deal with this experience of children. Uh, and um, Sherry has put it up. Uh, we don't have time to go through them, but maybe uh, Sherry, you could put that into the um, chat, you know, or, or something to so that people can refer to them. Some of these films, I'm sure, are familiar to many of you. For example, um, for example, uh, Life is Beautiful, uh, which was quite controversial when it first came out, and we could talk about it. Uh, uh, but also uh, Europa, Europa, and uh, Au revoir les enfants, which, which is a marvelous film uh, by the French filmmaker Louis Mal. And uh, uh, Au revoir les enfants is interesting uh, in terms of what Annette was saying uh, because, uh, because actually it's uh, narrated by a non-Jewish boy but it's about a Jewish friend of his and this is all takes place in a school for kids you know aged around 13. Uh, the, the narrator is a non-Jewish boy who is the survivor but he tells the story of his friendship with a Jewish boy in the school who actually was arrested and rounded up and taken away and did not survive. So in that film, you have both the perspective of the non-Jewish child, but also who's a, this, this child is a witness to the deportation of, of the Jewish child. Uh, and in a way feels guilty as a kind of survivor guilt uh, uh, about it. So, but to get to the crossing. so. Uh, so Sherry, I think we could probably do away with this list, unless you want to leave it up, it's fine with me. Uh, uh, so the question that I thought I would um, ask is, in what, way, um, in what way is the crossing similar to uh, other films, to these other films that I've, that I've put up? Uh, uh, how does it fit into the genre of the children film? children's film, and how is it unique? How is it different? Uh, well, we can start first of all with the similarities. Uh, and uh, the first one that I think is really interesting is that children in this, in this situation were forced to adopt uh, adult roles. This is, this is very important and, and applies not just of course to the Holocaust, but to any kind of traumatic historical calamity, which involves children, uh, where young children who should not be worrying about these things are forced to, to act like grownups. Uh, and there's a wonderful example of that in The Crossing. If you remember in the scene with the old lady where the kids arrive thinking that she's nice old lady, she offers them a, a sumptuous breakfast uh, and they're all happy. They're just stuffing themselves because they're not used to eating this kind of wonderful stuff, you know, eggs and ham and all that. But uh, Daniel, the, the, the Jewish boy uh, who's about, I don't know, he's just a kid really, uh, he's maybe 13 or, or so. Uh, Daniel is immediately very suspicious. He says, why does this woman have all this good stuff when everyone we know is going hungry. So his reaction and his action there is that of an adult. He's, he's learned to become very, very 
suspicious of any, to, to look around, to see whatever uh, uh, implies danger. Uh, and uh, he's also, for example, the protector of his young sister, of his, of his much younger sister. So there again, since their parents are, are uh, not there, uh, it's Daniel, who is, as I say, just a kid, but Daniel has to adopt the role of, of the protective uh, parent figure. Uh, and you see that in other films as well. Uh, even, you know, uh, it's a, even in Life is Beautiful, uh, where the child is a four-year-old boy, uh, he learns to act, and, and he's totally involved in this, this uh, myth, mythical game about what it means to live in the concentration camp, which his father has convinced him of. But when his father tells him at the end of the film, you hide in there, he hides in a little shed, you hide in there and don't leave, don't leave until everybody is gone. This kid of four is able to stay there for hours, it, see, it would appear, just waiting to see whether everybody goes. And it's only when in fact the place has completely emptied out that he finally comes out. So this kind of behavior is not normal for a four-year-old boy. It, it really means that the child has to, has to uh, adopt a much more mature uh, uh, point of view. Uh, uh, so there are many other examples in Faithless, for example, which is on your list, they're wonderful. Uh, the teenage boy who was deported has to work like uh, deported to, Aus to Auschwitz and to other camps. He has to work like an adult until he collapses, you know, and is miraculously saved by a doctor. But the point is he is forced into an adult role, even though he's only, you know, 13 or he's 14. So uh, that's one thing. And we see it in The Crossing, and we see it in many other films uh, about children having to act like adults. Uh, uh, and the other way that The Crossing is similar to, uh, to the other films and to the experience of children is that after all, they were children. So that's sort of the opposite. And as children, despite the fact that they have to act as adults, uh, at the same time, they are just kids. And so they love to play, their imagination roams free. Uh, and in The Crossing, we have a wonderful uh, example of that when Gerda, uh, who was completely fixated on the three musketeers, on her role as one of the musketeers, at, toward the end of the film, when they are exhausted, they're, they're being hunted by the, by the Germans with, with dogs. Uh, they're there in the forest in the snow. They, they stop for a second. And what happens, Gerda tells them the story of the three musketeers and the kids and she projects the, the other kids into the roles of the musketeers. So suddenly they all enter this imaginative world of play and that helps them in fact uh, to keep going. After that, they keep on going and they make it to the border. So, uh, so the, the way that children, despite everything, uh, are resilient in a way, uh, that's the sort of uh, trendy word right now about, about children and trauma, how they, despite everything, they are resilient. And one of the ways they are resilient is that they are still able to play and to imagine. And you have this in many, many other films. Um, I'll just give you, a, let's see, uh, are there a couple of, uh, uh, well, one of my, uh, two of my favorite examples are Jacob the Liar, which I highly recommend, the 74 version of the film. Uh, in Jacob the Liar, uh, the little, a little girl who actually has lost her parents, she's totally, you know, an orphan, uh, but she is uh, made sustained by uh, another, by Jacob, who tells her a fairy tale about a princess. And the little girl is able to project herself into the fairy tale as the princess. And she maintains that as, as, as a way of coping with this horrible situation, even at the point where they are being deported uh, on the train. So, so that I think is a very interesting other aspect of the crossing uh, that brings it into the into that uh, genre. Now, uh, I, 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 uh, I want to leave us time to talk, so I won't be, uh, I, I'm just gonna not give you any more examples, but 
to talk about the way that the crossing is unique or is different, uh, just let me mention a few things. One is, of course, it's set in Norway, which, uh, which is itself very interesting because there aren't that many films, certainly not about children, uh, uh, that take place in Norway. All the other films that I've listed are, uh, are, are from else, the kids are from France, Italy, Germany, or whatever. Uh, uh, but uh, so Norway is, 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 is very interesting for those of us who don't, may not know very much about what happened in Norway. Then, um, unlike the other films uh, where the children uh, are surrounded by adults of one kind or another. So there's the relationship between the adult and the child, Jacob and the little girl, the father and the boy in uh, Guido and his son in Life is Beautiful, uh, you know, the teachers and, uh, in uh, Orval les Enfants, where it all takes place in a boarding school. Uh, that, uh, and so you have a lot of act interaction between kids and adults. But in this film, most of the film takes place, uh, the most of the action occurs when the children are on their own. Uh, and, you know, almost like children in a fairy tale. Uh, Hansel and Gretel going off by themselves. Uh, so that is what um, I think is an interesting sort of uh, different feature in The Crossing. And it means that the filmmaker herself created a kind of fairy tale atmosphere to some degree uh, by having children uh, act like uh, children who go out, you know, and have adventures in a, in a fairy tale. Uh, the other thing that really interested me is that while in many films, in some of the most memorable films, the child is a boy. So the boy in Life is Beautiful, Au revoir les enfants, uh, The Two of Us, which is a great film. Uh, uh, one of the very early, in fact, the earliest one that I know uh, about a little boy in World War II in France. Uh, they're all boys. Uh, and here, the main character, the, 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 the center of consciousness, if you will, in the film is, is this Gerda, this wonderful little girl who just turned 10 uh, and is courageous, active. She's the one that leads them uh, across, you know, on the whole adventure. And she is also the moral center of the film. She knows from the beginning that she needs to rescue these kids. Uh, whereas her brother Otto, who's older uh, is a very interesting character, but you know, he's much more dubious uh, as, a, as an ethical figure, whereas she is straight, you know, it, it's really a great uh, feminist gesture, maybe. I don't know if, if that was intended as such by the filmmaker, but I, I think it's a very nice development. Uh, and by the way, uh, I highly recommend another film where a little girl uh, is, the, is the center of consciousness and it's right on our, you can even, see it today on the J by J Film Festival, which is When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. The title seems silly, but it's a really wonderful film uh, uh, about a German Jewish family. And there it's a nine year old girl who is the main figure, you know, uh, who, who's, whose eyes uh, uh, give us give us the story. So, uh, so I think that's probably uh, all that I want to say. Was there something else? Oh, Oh, well, I guess, yes, um, uh, I, uh, about what Annette said that, you know, it's about the, I agree with her that the film, yeah, emphasizes the rescue and the survival of the children. Uh, but of course, it's a family film. So uh, one can understand why, uh, you know, uh, in Au revoir les enfants, it's an absolutely tragic story of a boy who was arrested uh, uh, and, and taken away, whereas, uh, in this, in this one ends in a more upbeat way, uh, but as I say, maybe it's understandable. So thank you. I, I think uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you, both of you. Um, I, there are three questions in the chat right now that I think I'll raise now, um, and, and then I'll go back to some other other questions that that we had talked about before. Um, the first question, and in fact, Annette, I, I think these three questions are basically for you. Um, how many righteous Gentiles from uh, Norway have been recognized? Um, the second question is, uh, the producer of the film has said that children in Norway are not educated about the Holocaust. And 
the person that has asked this question is asking whether it's true. And the third question is in the movie, the parents who were members of the resistance were released from detention at the end of the film. And the questioner is asking how realistic is their being returned home? Well, um, about the righteous Gentiles, uh, there are for now 67 people that have been recognized as righteous Gentiles. Among those are the participants in this Carl Fredriksen's distribution company uh, rescue action, and also um, those who were um, responsible for evacuating the Jewish children from the orphanage in Oslo in time so they uh, could be rescued and were not deported. They have been recognized. And then there are some um, single uh, people that have been also uh, uh, involved in, in most of all uh, hiding or rescuing people to, to Sweden. Um, how representative this recognition is for everyone who were involved in, in, in rescuing 1,200 Jews, uh, I don't know. But it's been an increased focus, uh, I think, over the last um, 20, 25 years, also by the Holocaust Center in Oslo, in order to uh, nominate people who were involved in resistance and rescue actions uh, for um, the, the this righteous Gentiles recognition. Um, about um, children in Norway not being educated about the Holocaust, I will have to disagree with the producer, I think. Uh, I would say that it was, would absolutely be true for my generation. I was, when I went to school in the 80s, uh, it was uh, the, the story about the Norwegian Jews was about their rescued. If, if the, if the topic came up at all. But I would say that this has, uh, has changed in Norway over the last 30 years, also thanks to the Holocaust centers. And also um, uh, I would say that sort of the, the, the memorial of the Falstaff Center um, have uh, sort of school classes coming from the whole region uh, to, to learn more about the Second World War and, and the Holocaust. So of course, I think that it's maybe different from school to school, but uh, the focus uh, since the mid 1990s have also been on, on the Holocaust. But I would say that what um, children in Norway know very little about is Jewish history as such, because when it's talked about the Jews in Norway, it's always about, the, it is about the Holocaust and not about Jewish history uh, as such. Um, and the parents and the resistance who were released at the end of the film, well, maybe that's also part of the fairy tale. <laughs> um, if they had been arrested for um, so involvement in rescue actions of, uh, uh, of Jews, they most certainly would have been executed, uh, which was the case with, with Rolf Sieverschen, for example, who, who, who sort of set up the Carl Fredrickson distribution company action. Um, but uh, of course, if they were arrested for various resistance activities, they were, uh, they, you know, it, it depended on what kind of verdict. Uh, they might have been sent to a, a concentration camp in Norway or um, in, in, in Germany. But um, if they had been arrested for uh, helping Jews escape to Sweden, they most certainly would have been executed sort of in, in reality. But I think this is, a, this is a family film and therefore it's not portrayed. So uh, one member of the audience has asked whether or not this is uh, based on a true story. It, it's my understanding that, that this screenplay was sort of a composite of, of different stories, uh, am I correct there? Yes, I, I, um, it's, uh, as far as I know, uh, there is no story about children rescuing children to, to Sweden, but I would say that this is sort of um, 
uh, is combined by different stories. I would, uh, especially as I see a lot of uh, similarities between this Carl Fredriksen distribution company, the way the, the escape is organized. And then, uh, but it's, it's a fictional story, but made into, a, it's a children's film, I would say, yeah. So um, another member of our audience has asked or, or has said, I, I, and this is directed toward, toward Susan, um, I think we all ask ourselves, uh, would we have been as courageous as Goethe? And she's asking Susan, what's your experience of children exhibiting that level of courageousness during the, uh, the Holocaust? Uh, and, and whether or not there are, are any examples. And, and I would add to that the question of, um, Gerta and, and Otto grow up in the same household. Um, they have the same parents uh, and, and yet their personalities and their reaction to all of this is very different. And I'm, I'm wondering if there is something that you can think of that accounts for that. Well, uh, you know, we could actually say that uh, Possibly answering your second question first, and and but I'll answer the, the the other question that was asked by one of our viewers as well, uh, is that one of the differences is Otto is a realist, right? He he tells Gerda at one point in their bedroom, uh, you don't understand anything, you know, like you you uh, he has already figured out that that there's something going on, you know, with the with the kit with the basement and all that. She doesn't really get it. So is it a matter of age he's a little older than she is or is that that he's really you know he's a guy with the compass I mean he can figure out he has a map he has a compass he's a realist she on the other hand uh, has been uh, inhabiting the world of the three musketeers she is she is in a world where in fact the good guys and the bad guys are against each other on issues of, of good and evil, you know? So in a way you could say that, that uh, this is my, my, this may be my bias as a professor of literature, but actually uh, not completely wrong. I think literature and art, uh, uh, I think engage us in ways that, uh, that do sharpen our moral awareness. Uh, and I was very interested today, there was a big, uh, 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 report of an interview that Michiko Kakutani did with uh, Barack Obama, uh, based you know after his uh, memoir, and she asked him you know what what made you who you are or whatever, and he said it was all the reading that I did, uh, and he really uh, as a kid already and as a young man was doing a huge amount of reading of all the great not just works of you know nonfiction but the great works of literature, and he says at one point. Literature really uh, gives you a sense of what is uh, important in the world. So, so in a way, I, you could say that Goethe, aside from just having a different personality, is a kid who has been sharpened, you know, in her moral vision by her uh, by her uh, her sort of inhabiting this this world uh, of the Three Musketeers. Uh, now, as for whether children uh, display uh, the kind of you know grown-upness or courage that she did, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. I mean, I think, you know, there are, there are um, memoirs and stories about, for example, Europa Europa, which is the, um, uh, another film that I put on our list. The, it's based on a memoir by a survivor, Solomon Peril. He went through the most unbelievable things as a teenager, a young teenager who escaped from Berlin in 1938. And, uh, spent the war, he was very good looking and didn't quote, look Jewish. He spent the war in a Nazi sort of school for, for Aryans. He was the example of the Aryan beauty uh, that, they, that they brought up. He was pretending for, ye for a couple of years to be a German, you know, non-Jewish kid. That takes an incredible amount of wit and courage, you know. And you have uh, examples of that, um, you know, even, uh, well, even, you know, that little boy, two of us, you know, he just, uh, uh, he's separated from his parents. He's, he's in the home of this old uh, farmer who's a real anti-Semite, but he loves the little boy. He doesn't know the kid is Jewish. And, you know, the little boy plays around with this guy. He, he teases him about his anti-Semitism in, in a way. 
And, you know, that takes an incredible degree of um, maturity or poise for an eight-year-old kid, you know, to be able to do that. At the same time, he has to hide his circumcision because he's circumcised. And if they, in those days, if, if, if any kid is circumcised, it was a sign of his Jewishness. So the child clearly, you know, exhibits a terrific amount of, of self-control, of, of, of ability to, to, you know, uh, to, to uh, uh, overcome the situation and in fact, even plays. So I would say that uh, it's surprising what children are capable of uh, when they are placed in, uh, in front of such demands. So uh, Annette, another, another <laughs> member of the audience has, has asked um, how the film has been received in, in, in Norway after its release. Uh, well, it's been mixed response. Um, I've, it's been popular uh, among uh, youth, and uh, I think that uh, also, uh, I mean, the, it's, the film is an adaptation of the book, uh, which was also quite uh, quite popular and, and sort of well received as as uh, youth literature. But uh, at the same time, um, uh, the reception has also, especially sort of discussing the film for an adult audience, uh, raised the question to, to what extent one can actually construct such a narrative um, uh, in light of the debates uh, that have been going on in Norway since, since 2018. Because in 2018, fall 2018, a Norwegian journalist published a book uh, sort of what, um, with the title, What Did the Home Front Know? And, and raised the question to what extent the Norwegian resistance had been warned um, that something was going to happen to the Norwegian Jews and to why they hadn't reacted uh, earlier and, and why more Jews weren't uh, saved. And, and the second part of the book raised the topic uh, of uh, sort of who paid for these rescue actions, that being rescued by Carl Fredriksen distribution company had not been um, uh, free of charge, that uh, Jewish um, persons had to pay more to be rescued than resistance fighters that needed to, to be brought to Sweden, for example. Uh, so, um, and, and this is, this, this book has been heavily debated and it's also a question to what extent everything that the facts in the book are, are actually correct. But uh, I think the negative um, response to the film has mainly been about uh, sort of the, the, the heroic story and, and to what extent one shouldn't, uh, after everything we know from historical research, especially over the last 20 years, that uh, the Norwegian the Norwegian resistance have been uh, portrayed um, um, one-sidedly too positive and to what extent when, when making a film about Norway during the Second World War in 2020, one should also portray the not so honorable actions by, by Norwegians. And um, maybe this is a film for your next film festival, but uh, there will be a, a film released, uh, I think now it's, it's end of December this year, with the title, um, The Largest Crime, uh, which is about Holocaust in Norway, where the, the main focus is on the people who were arrested and deported and um, sort of what that meant for those family members who were able to, to survive. And uh, this new film uh, will also depict the fact that the, the Norwegian um, state police, which was the Norwegian sort of uh, nazified um, political police operating on behalf of the, the uh, Nazi party, that they were also heavily involved in uh, the arrests and deportations of, of Norwegian Jews. So I, I've been told that we can go on for a few more minutes. Um, okay. So, uh, Annette, I'm going to follow up uh, that last question with another one, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering, is it possible to, to build a characterization of a typical Norwegian rescuer? Um, we know that religious aff affiliation, for example, frequently played a role in motivating rescuers elsewhere during the Holocaust. 
um, what role did religious affiliation and religious organizations uh, play in the case of, of Norway? And were other factors like personal income, profession, or location, for example, urban versus rural, were those all, all uh, factors and in, in decisions to become rescuers? Um, I think the, the, the people who become re uh, rescuers, uh, sort of, they differ a lot uh, when it comes to people working at sort of border pilots or these uh, guides bringing people over to Sweden. A lot of them were younger men, uh, or at least men, uh, more politically motivated than, than religiously. Uh, um, many of them background from sort of working class uh, people. But um, but then there were rescues that I would say it's it's um, um, it varies a lot because there could be a chain of helpers. So when it was uh, the question of sort of hiding people or providing clothes or, or food for people in hiding, that role was often taken by women. And then when it comes to driving the lorries or organizing uh, sort of uh, the walk through the woods to the Swedish border, that was often done by local people because you needed the local knowledge where it would be safest to, to, to cross, where would the, the German troops be, where would Norwegian police be. Um, so I think it's, it's impossible to give a, a precise answer to that. But when it comes to, um, to the role of the uh, Norwegian church, for example, um, they were not so much involved in this exact rescue action, but they were, um, when uh, the Norwegian Nazi um, uh, collaboration uh, regime uh, attempted to uh, draw up a law that would forbid Jews and non-Jews in Norway to marry. Uh, the church in Norway protested and managed to raise uh, a lot of attention um, towards these plans. So the plans were actually cancelled and there were no law uh, that prevented marriage between Jews and non-Jews, for example. Um, so, uh, and the church did play um, uh, a large role in sort of uh, keeping up the spirits for opposing the Nazi regime, refusing Nazification of, of church, for example, um, reading uh, 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 anti-fascist appeals in the church uh, during service, for example. Uh, but I'm, I'm more unsure about the rescue act, uh, actions. I've not heard uh, about the church being directly involved in, in those. So I, I think we have, we have time for for maybe one more question. Um, Susan, I'm, I am, as you know, fixated on this issue of, of Otto and uh, Otto as sort of the prepubescent who's um, a, a little heavier, he, he seems a little awkward. Um, this strikes me as a kid who's very much trying to, to fit in and his relationship with this friend whose father is the the, the local um, Nazi leader. I, I, I'm wondering what your reaction to um, to those scenes was. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Sherry also posted a thing in the chat, you know, that Otto may have been uh, influenced, you know, by this desire to fit in, and he has a friend whose father is a is a. Incidentally, so the film does show. Uh, some uh, some Nazi collaborators among the Norwegians. It's not only good Norwegians, uh, but uh, but um, yes, I think Otto, in some ways, you could say, is the most complex character in the among the children because he actually changes a little, at least somewhat. We we assume in the course of the film, since in the beginning he kind of buys. The idea that these Jews are not like us, the Jews are outsiders. He, uh, you know, and then gradually, uh, and then he has that incredible fight with Daniel, you know, who is about the same age. Daniel may be a year older or something. Uh, you know, they fight in the snow, and then suddenly they actually make up. So, so you can see that in a way, Otto is a character who actually evolves. Because the other, the, the 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 Jewish kids don't evolve, and you could criticize that, I suppose, in that they are not, you know, we don't see as much 
of them. They don't occupy as much screen time and we don't get much about their feelings other than that they're trying to, to you know, survive. But, uh, but Otto, and, and Gerda doesn't change because she's the same from one end to the other. You know, she's this wonderful young girl. Uh, uh, but, um, but, but Otto is the one who actually changes. So as a, as a, as a character, as a literary character or a fictional character, he is more, I'm not surprised that you are fixated on him because he is, you know, more uh, interesting in that sense. People who change are more interesting than people who, who don't, I guess, uh, at least in literature. Um, so, you know, um, yeah. So I'm, I, I'm going to take one more question from the, the chat and, and then I think we're going to have to bring this discussion to, the cl to a close. Um, one, uh, Annette, one member of our audience has noted that um, the policeman, um, the soldier, um, the conductor uh, all, all play a role in, in protecting um, the children. Uh, and, and this member of the audience is asking whether this is an attempt to sort of um, solve sav, um, Norwegian guilt for, for supporting um, uh, the Nazi regime. Uh, it might be. Um, I think it's... Um, um, I think it's... Uh, you know, what's different in the film um, um, compared to sort of older, more traditional Norwegian films on, on the Second World War and, and sort of having a very... Um, one-sided focus on, on Norwegian resistance is that in, in this film you have a, a German soldier who tries to help the children or at least uh, doesn't tell on them and then you have this uh, this elderly um, grandma figure uh, that uh, turns out to be a Nazi uh, so that's sort of supposed to be the alibi for that the story uh, that the film tells uh, um, um, a more different uh, story or a more complex story, but I do think that uh, um, a very, for me, but of course, looking at the film as a grown-up, I don't know what I would think if I was a child, but um, I think it's a weak point or a weak part of the film that it doesn't uh, include more of Norwegian collaboration and um, uh, both by the police and by by um, sort of Norwegian population uh, as such. Well, so could I, I would... put in my two cents here about because uh, I know the French situation. I don't know the Norwegian situation, but I know the French one. And there was a fairly wide variety of responses. I mean, the French police, as as I'm sure many of you know, were very much involved in the roundup of Jews in France. In the same year, 42 was the worst year in France. Uh, so, so the French police were the ones who went to people's houses, knocked on the door and told them to get out and get in the bus. Uh, but it was, but it's also true that there were some French policemen who showed up before and said, you know, tomorrow we're going to come and, and, and knock on your door. So get the hell out of here, you know, because if they weren't there, then they couldn't round them up. So, so that there was a, the, while I would say most French police collaborate, cooperated and did their job, uh, you know, on the other hand, there were some who, who, who in fact had uh, decided not to, that it was not right to do it. So, so it's not totally out of the, out of quest the question that some of these Norwegians, uh, like, you know, the conductor, uh, mm -hmm. actually, you know, he was the exception. Maybe a different conductor yeah. would have, you know, luck, let, let's not forget, <laughs> luck played a huge role in real life, in the life yeah. of the surviving children and non-children and, and Jews in general. So, the fact that these kids are lucky by getting a conductor, you know, who who actually is nice, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true, or that or that it was merely to assuage assuage the guilt of of of, uh, of Norwegians. 
What do you think? Uh, no, I, I, agree, I agree on that. And it was basically the same in Norway. So the majority of the police um, collaborated uh, or sort of did what I sort of argued they had to do. Uh, but there were some exceptions, and there are also stories of, of policemen warning those that they were supposed to, to arrest. But um, I think it's um, I think it's problematic when it's the exceptions that are portrayed all the time because oh. it's not representative of how the situation would have been in, in real life. And I think especially, um, I, and I think that's also something that Norway and France have uh, got in common. Both countries could sort of hide behind the story of being occupied and having sort of a, a, a large resistance movement. But uh, and, and, and this positive sides have, have fo gotten so much focus that uh, the question of collaboration um, have been ne neglected for, for so long. Well, and I not think in France. Also in France, uh, now in the last... Uh... Uh, 25 years or so, there's been a lot of attention on the on the on the uh, collaborationist regime, you know, mm. Vichy in their and their role in the persecution of Jews. But uh, maybe in maybe it's coming in Norway too. Although I guess Quisling, right, is is uh, is well known, and then his collaboration with the Nazis is well known. Yeah, the political collaboration is well known, and I think that uh, also uh, the historical research over the last 25 years has uh, clearly demonstrated how involved the Norwegian police uh, was, and, and also uh, Norwegian ministries and uh, sort of the bureaucracy on different level, levels. Um, so it's known in the historiographical research, uh, but when a movie is made, it's always the nice uh, side that is being depicted. I see, yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, I have to bring this wonderful conversation to a, to a close. Um, I want to thank both of you very much for a, a really stimulating discussion. And I want to thank all of you for, for joining us. Um, right now, there is another talk back on uh, the movie uh, uh, Mother Road um, that you can switch over to. And then at 5 p.m. today, there is a music conversation with uh, Seth Cabell. And also at 6 p.m. today, uh, there is a Hanukkah candle lighting with the DC JCC. So um, thank you all again for, for joining us. And please enjoy the rest of the festival. Tim, can I have the last word? Sure. I uh, just wanted to mention that I put some information that Jim read in the chat. There's also a 7 p.m. talk back with director, um, I think it's Judith Helfand on the film Love and Stuff, which is a great film um, about mothers and daughters and the relationship that they share. And I would highly recommend it um, to see the film and also to, um, to be part of the talk back. And uh, last but not least, I'm going to send out the fantastic list that Susan put together of films about the Holocaust that feature children to everybody who was here today that registered. I'll have your email address and you can get that list of films and hopefully enjoy some of them. And then I too want to thank Annette for being here from Norway mm -hmm. and spending time creating this program with us. And Susan, Susan, where are you from? Harvard, that area? Uh, well, well now, right now I live in Washington in, okay. in Chevy Chase, but but yes, okay. I spent many years at Harvard. Yes. Okay, a local a local lady for being here, Jim. Thank you so much for moderating today. You did a fantastic job, and I know that this is your passion based on your bio. And then also, I don't want to uh, forget Omid Barbara Finkel, um, who worked tremendously to put this fantastic panel together. Um, and also BJ, who's in the background or was in the background, I can't see if she's still here, um, our co-chair of the Northern Virginia Jewish Film Festival Committee, who worked hard to help put everything together as well for this um, film festival that was basically a collaboration of three JCCs. So um, thank you all for your great questions, as Jim said, and for participating today. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the end of the festival and happy Hanukkah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Sherry. Bye. 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 Bye.